connected. There we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was just explaining to Ali about um, one of the tricks for feeding your worms when you just have a few worms and your system's going is it, it, you can add quite a bit more of the bedding, especially in this case, if you're using coconut coir, you'll dilute out the food scraps so that they'll be um, less susceptible to going anaerobic while um, while you're waiting for the worms to get through the food. So Ali replied, yeah. So I would, I would um, weight that with the coconut coir because of the structure of the coconut coir will keep the food more um, suspended. The um, paper cardboard tends to collapse a bit more and it's more susceptible to losing the air. Um, okay, the next question is, is fly ash toxic to worms? Um, okay, so we're getting the whole question. Um, someone's building a raised garden bed with cinder blocks, but happened to find out that the um, cinder blocks are made with fly ash and may can leach toxins into the soil. So I decided to switch to plants instead. Um, what you could do actually is um, that cinder block bed is fine, but I would just line it with say a, a waterproof liner and that'll sort of prevent the leaching from happening. And that also gives you the opportunity to um, turn it into wicking bed if you choose. Say for example, during droughts, I really like using wicking beds because it saves a lot in watering time. And I can explain more about that process for people who are interested in. The other thing I noticed, I was rebuilding one of my garden beds a couple days ago, and it looks like the landscape cloth you put at the bottom of the bed um, only works for a couple of years before the roots of nearby trees can push their way through. And so if you have a, a more impenetrable barrier, um, then you're more likely to um, protect it from the, the root invasion from below. Um, if you do that, though, you have to be a little careful to make sure you're still getting drainage. And so um, you'd, you'd have to let it seep out from the sides. It's it's a work in progress long term. But what basically what I did was I set up a sub pod near some very uh, water loving trees. And so it's a real test and I'll have a, a good sort of laboratory to experiment with the best solution in that situation. Um, yeah, the fly ash in cinder block. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, that is a foolproof solution. So if you um, waterproof the cinder blocks and with plastics, that, that could work as well. Um, what I would say is that... Um, Hi, Sally. The worms are really great about um, avoiding foods they don't like, and so Typically, what will happen is the microbes are really good about breaking down substances and the worms can avoid them while they're um, difficult to, to be managing, as long as it's a low concentration. So if we're talking about something that's seeping from uh, cinder blocks, uh, my, my intuitive hit is it's fine. I haven't come across any sort of concerns in the web out there about people having bad experiences. Maybe when I see, welcome Sally. Uh, Hi Sally, do you have questions for us? I'm on my first year with this thing. I've got a, uh, I, I've got a single unit and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I'm in Wisconsin, what happens in mm -hmm. the winter? Do I need to do any special preparations? Yes, um, good, you're anticipating that. So there's a couple strategies from passive to active. The passive strategies are about just creating insulation around the um, the bed and the sub pod so that you into the bedding. And then, um, is it in a place where you'll be able to keep feeding the worms during the winter? Uh, you have access? Yeah, I should be able to. Okay, okay. So, so generally, um, the first order business is to create insulation that traps still air so that you keep the cold air from sucking the um, heat out of the system. And one thing that's worked really well for people is to take uh, eggshell cartons and lay them on top of a worm blanket and then add a second worm blanket on top of that. And what that does is it, this is inside the chamber of the subpod. This will actually trap uh, a nice amount of heat. 
And then if you put a thick layer of mulch in the soil around the bed, um, that'll also prevent the soil itself around the subpod from cooling off too much. Okay, sounds good. There's also there's also a um, an opportunity to go onto the um, grow hub, and there's a number of articles there about people that have overwintered their subpod systems. And so when I say passive to active. There's one guy who's actually put in a germination pad uh, on the top of his subpod to add a little additional supplemental heat, but that would require getting power to your site, maybe more trouble than it's worth. If you can get by with just passive solutions, um, the next level beyond the insulation is, is adding what's called a cold frame, um, which you can buy cheaply. Um, I think sure. Walmart sells them for about $15, where basically they have a size that plops right on top of uh, a small garden bed, including this size we sell. And uh, you should be able to find information on people doing that uh, on top of their um, worm system. So I think that should cover it, but please come back to us with any questions you have. And it's good you're anticipating it now before the weather really gets cold. Yeah, it's we're on the verge. I mean, I'm shutting down the garden right now. So mm -hmm. I, I created kind of an interesting by default, you know, how those happy ac accidents happen in the garden. On sure. one side, yeah. I planted pole beans. Uh -huh. And on the other side, I planted zinnias. And I just dumped a bunch of um, small sunflowers, the short ones in there. Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, except for the fact that I have to dig my head into that place to get anything to do anything in there. I kept that thing really nice and cool. You know, even in Wisconsin, nice. it gets hot up here. And right. on the hottest days, I had a great deal of shade in there. So um, I'll, I'll have to do that again. And I just haven't had a chance to research any of this. It's been crazy here. Okay. So. Well, that's, that's a good, I'll file that one away as a suggestion to other people. Cause it's nice if you can create umbrellas from plants rather than having to lash up an umbrella to the top of your sub pod. Yeah, well, putting pole beans on the direct sun side of it will be my strategy in the future. Great. Because, you know, they're and they're still growing strong. I'm still picking pole beans. And the, oh, nice. the other thing that I want to try, I don't know if anybody on the site has tried trombolinos. But oh, I have. I've grown them. Yeah, I've got a monster out there and I'm. <laughs> and it's, it's great fun. So if anybody's adventurous and, you know, that'd be a thing to put around it, too, because it creates so much vegetation. It's a jungle in there. It's true. And then you can, because when they get really big, they're just suitable for composting. So you, it'll be great worm food at the end when you harvest the um, the long ones. If you harvest them young enough, they'll actually be, in, you can actually eat them like you would zucchinis. But once they get really huge, then um, they're a bit tough. Just like a normal zucchini, it can sort of go past it, but then they'll be perfect for the sub pod. I've been spiraling and eating them um, spiraled in oh. breads and desserts and things like that so and they're and they're resistant okay. to the to the squash bore so okay that so people if people are struggling with the squash bore on their zucchinis this, this thing can tolerate it the other That's question i know. had because i have a mm -hmm. single unit how do i start to harvest out of that there's a few options so so one option is if you take handfuls and then you array that around the um, bed they'll find the worms will find their way back into the bed but Another thing I like to do is to make compost extracts where you can take the worms and compost out, put it into a mesh bag, like a paint strainer bag, and then swish that into some water, a bucket of water, and then you can use that straight as an extract. And it's a quick process. You're basically just um, dissolving whatever comes out of the casting, which would include a lot of the microbes and the smaller material that gets through the mesh. And then you quickly return the worms back to the sub pod. So that would actually reduce the bulk of um, the castings that are being produced. And the mm -hmm. nice thing is you can in real time be using the, um, the fertilizer um, in, in places beyond the bed itself. So other plants, house plants and other things you'd like to, to nurture with um, the compost uh, nutrients. Okay, great, um, thank you. Yeah, that's what I'd start with. And then when it's really full, um, there's a couple of other things you can do that are a bit more involved, but why, I'd start with that first and see how far that gets you because I I really am gratified by taking the extracts and then just foliar feeding that onto my plants and you really see them respond quite well. 
I've noticed that with banana skins when I've made banana tea, I, they really respond quickly. Mm. And you can always add a bit of seaweed extract to really add a few trace minerals and really make sure that um, plants are getting everything they need. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a bit of fish emulsion if you want to give them a little extra nitrogen, depending on the plants, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Ellie. Who have you got there with you? Hey, this is my daughter, Austin. We were outside, but the mosquitoes were getting us, so. Oh. Hey, hi, Austin. Oh, and <laughs> We got the, the baby to sleep and oh. we decided to jump on. So I was explaining Good. to her the whole Zoom thing, which is new to a seven-year-old, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We FaceTime, but we don't do a lot of groups. So she said, what can they, can they hear us? All that, so. You can when you're unmuted. And we're in Australia, all the way down. Yeah, they're in Australia. The hemisphere. Yeah. Pretty cool. We'll have to check that out on a map again, huh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you have any questions for us, Austin and Ellie? Do you have any questions? No. Austin was actually asking, we saw some ants last time, and I know you guys mm -hmm. would probably recommend that that's part of the, the you know, the whole uh, little atmosphere that you're making, but she was asking if the ants would hurt the, the worms at all. Good right? question. Yeah, so luckily they don't typically tend to attack the worms. Um, but what could happen is if they decide to build a nest inside the subpod, you do want to chase them out because then they then they'll they'll lay a, a bunch of eggs in there and it could just create some sort of issues over time. So um, if it if it gets to the point where you see them really build up, you see just a few ants crawling through, that's not a big deal. But if you really start to see them build up, what I recommend for people is to make a little saucer um, that you can put in a 50-50 mix of sugar and borax. And you put that saucer on top of the worm blanket inside of the subpod. And so what'll happen is they'll feed on that and that'll that'll take care of them. Take them out. Okay. And then there's yeah. the, something to be said for keeping it uh, more moist. They're kind of not not interested or is that the yes. roots? Yes. Okay. That's, no, that's true. That's true. They, they, a tend, bit. they tend, and it depends on the species of ant, but generally speaking, they'll colonize drier places than wetter places. Once it gets too wet, they don't like to, to stay there. Good, So awesome. the worms the worms will definitely take it a bit on the wetter side. So you have that option of um, keeping the bedding fairly wet. And depending on your climate, some people can wet the worm blanket and keep it wet. But the disadvantage with that is in the summertime, it would mean wetting it every single day. So that, yeah. <laughs> that quickly becomes problematic. Yes, well, thank you. Sure. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. <laughs> so, Brent, oh. <laughs> Brandon, yeah. Welcome. If you've got any questions for us, Brandon, you're welcome to either join by video or just unmute or pop questions into the chat. Yeah, Looks hi. Looks like he's unmuted. Oh. Yeah. Um, so I'm somewhat new at gardening. I had a sub pod for about uh, going on a year now. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like... Uh, it's about maybe halfway to three quarters uh, full of compost uh, so far. Right. Is that normal mm -hmm. or should I have more by now? I'm not sure. If maybe no, I'm no, it's, it's actually pretty surprising how, how efficient the worms are at reducing the volume of your waste to compost. And so part of it is um, a tribute to the, to the nutrient density of that compost. When you think of all the veggies that contributed to it and the rule of thumb is about 50 fold reduction in volume so if you visualized how much volume of food scraps you've been adding, you, over time you'd expect to see only a you know, 50th of that in, in the castings. So if you're, but, but if you're ready to start using it with that amount of time, it's probably nice and rich and brown and good smelling, I would imagine at this point, is that true? Yes. Okay, so what I've been recommending is, is a really simple um, extract and nothing fancy, you don't have to be bubbling water with air stones and all that, just literally just grab a couple handfuls out of the subpod, worms and all, and you put that into a paint, paint strainer bag or a fine mesh. Catherine's got an example right here for us, <laughs> right? Okay. Nice. okay. <laughs> and, and basically you, you, you put that into a bucket of water and swish it around just for you know, a few minutes is enough and you'll see the water turn dark brown and you'll have extracted quite a bit of the goodies, the soluble goodies out of the castings. 
and then you can f um, feed the leaves of all your plants with that, and they'll they'll respond rather quickly. Okay. So um, you can you can be doing that, you know, every week or so uh, for plants you really want to give a kick along, especially fast growing vegetables will um will really you'll see them green up, and and then I sometimes if I'm really feeling um like I have the extra effort to do it, I'll add a bit of seaweed extract and um, a bit of uh, fish emulsion. So to the same kind of um, concentration as they recommend when you look at the label of seaweed extract and fish emulsion. So Catherine's just bringing over an example. Well, this one looks like it's okay. So it's, there is interesting in Australia here, we have um, a, an invasive carp species and so people have been um, turning, turning that into fish emulsion, getting rid of an invasive carp. So it feels like you're not, you're not actually doing a non-sustainable non thing in the ecosystem. You're getting rid of a pest species right. and turning it into a valuable resource. But yeah, the castings are pretty magic. Yeah, the castings on their own are, are, are you'll, you'll see a difference. And interestingly enough, the castings have, um, hormones of some, or people are calling them hormones, but a, a root stimulating component that um, really um, gives them a unique um, extra growth for roots of plants. So I haven't done the experiments to see if you want to be watering that into the soil or whether it works to be feeding the leaves, but you could take some of that extract and water it around the base of the plant to make sure the roots are stimulated as well. Okay. And, and then after you uh, soak the paint strainer bag, you put the worms and all the compost back into the sub pod? Exactly, that's it. And so you're, um, you're only having the water around the worms for a handful of minutes. And so it's not stressful for them. They can, they can handle being underwater for a while. I wouldn't recommend leaving it there because um, they, they do breathe through their skin. So if they were, they were in there too long, it wouldn't be great. But if within an hour or so, it's totally fine. And I usually just do a few minutes where I'll swish it around, uh, release it till the water's dark and then put the worms back in. Okay. And is there ever a time when, or would it be beneficial to take some of that and uh, compost and worms and put it in other beds? Sure. Yep, yep, you can do that too. So um, the time frame you've, you've been keeping your system going, it's totally fine. So after, after you've reached a point where you're no longer seeing raw food scraps, um, all of that casting material is ready to use uh, in other beds. And so you can, um, there's a couple of ways to separate the worms from the castings. I have a, an article online about they, they avoid sun. And so you can mound them up and scrape away the outside of the mound and the worms keep crawling into the in, in, inner part of the mound. And then you can harvest the castings free of the worms, return the worms back to the system. I'm also working out a, a trommel system where you can have a, a like a, a drum that's mesh based and you turn the crank and the castings fall through and leave the worms behind. But that's that's an R&D project at the moment. Or so isn't there compostives out there or something you can make? Yeah, you can, but or? when I've when I've experimented with like the um, compost sieves that people can buy. You can do a little bit that way, but I think it's just as quick to do the um, the sun, the sun yeah. avoidance method. Maybe yeah. we'll do a whole live on at your yeah. place doing Could a harvest do a harvest session just to show people. Yeah, the different, the different methods. methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. We're actually looking for topics. We thought that rather than just every week having the same setup, we'd do one week where we we do do a Zoom on a specific topic, or we'd we'd film a live at Peter's property where he's got lots of sub pods. So if there's any ideas of topics that you might want, like, you know, as I said, harvesting or um, any sort of gardening um, or worm or compost related topics, um, that send them through. And uh, yeah, we'll start doing a little series of, um, you know, specialized, uh, detailed information sessions. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyone else got any more questions while we're here live though? I was just curious your backgrounds and how you got into sub pod and, and the whole industry. Oh yeah. Just for sure. curiosity. Yeah, well, I was um I was a scientist doing stem cell biology and cancer biology in my old life. And um then I was ready for um 
kind of a bit of a change when I noticed planet heating up and you know the environment needing some help and I wanted to be a bit more directly uh, using my knowledge about biology in a way that would help heal the planet and so I um, part of it was a leap of faith I left what I was doing and kind of opened myself up to see what would come and present itself and then uh, mo had moved to Australia and after a few a few different trips and then ended up meeting up with Andrew who had invented this interesting composting system and I got stimulated to think this could be um, part of the next chapter so that was my journey with it so I feel like for me I can sort of bring some of the science that I um, know to help troubleshoot and inspire people and then bring that into both the plants and the microbes and the worms and awesome yeah, he's our science guy and he's really good at doing research. So if you've got any topics, he, he's, he's really used to diving in and finding out the answers to things. So that's why we started this series, of course. And, and for me, it, it came around food. My, my whole interest was, was growing food when I lived on a remote island and once a week the barge would come in with, with supplies and if you didn't get over the hill in time, you missed out. So I it's started... Uh, yeah, so I started... Uh, <laughs> by throwing a seed just into the ground that was there. And when I realized that there was a bit more involved than just putting a seed in the ground, it, that uh, it was really about having to, to create good soil and, and all the ingredients that go in towards making plants happy. Um, so that started my journey and in interest with uh, growing things. And then, I'm, of course, I've known Andrew for like over 35 years when he was uh, you know, composting, but he was also recycling, and building houses out of recycled everything. And, uh, and he rang me one day saying, what do you think about um, me coming up to where you guys are and uh, starting a compost business? And I was like, great. <laughs> so he turned up and we were, he was awesome. you know, playing around with the different systems and hand making them, drilling holes into sides of, you know, different pipes and different, fat, different materials, recycled materials. Um, and then we went, well, look, we're either going to keep doing this hand-built versions and it's only going to sort of, you know, uh, supply it to the local market or we you know take it to the world so we we're very lucky he was good at attracting people like Peter and Sadi yeah. our CEO and a few of the other the other Peter and so we all decided to yeah dedicate our, our working life to uh, getting some pot out into the world and and inspiring people to think about you know the relationship between their food waste and soils and growing things and and something that we can all do, you know, from our backyards to help. Well, and it was interesting during COVID with um, everyone needing to find something that felt, you know, kind of stimulating and, and yeah. nourishing when you're stuck at home. So it actually turned out to be opportune to to have people have that relationship being cultivated while they were, you know, kind of in a period of uncertainty. So, and I noticed for me, that was really helpful to see things growing and healthy and active in the middle of everything else going on. So I think in general too, it's just whatever part we can play at a personal level against um, climate change just feels a bit empowering to, to do things. Absolutely. And I have to say as a customer, the whole experience has been really great from um, just customer service and questions and the product was easy to put together and understand. Right. And you have these companies that you kind of hold higher than the rest. Like we have Southwest Airlines here in America, of course, and they're just wonderful. And then Apple is mm -hmm. kind of one of those without the politics of big companies, you know, there's just some that kind of get it right. And it just feels like somebody was thinking when they put it together and you guys are definitely in that category. So oh, cheers on that. Are you hearing that too? <laughs> about to come to australia oh. sometime. we can hang out yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah yeah visit us oh, when, we're just when getting you're... up this new there's a couple more members of the team come in and show yourself they're just just saying how fantastic hi hello really enjoy. Yes, hi. it's chloe and then we've got sadi over here who's our ceo hi and, uh, nice to meet everyone and a big part of it for me was teaching the kids because I dabbled in a little bit of compost, not so logical with my dad growing up and, um, you know, growing mm -hmm. foods and things, but I wanted to carry it on with the kids. So it's really fun nice. to be able to, nice. to do that. Well, starting them out young with that relationship to the soil and plants and that's great. Yeah. 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 Of course, we're in Texas, so it's like the worst weather and the worst soil, but we're trying. <laughs> Raise well, help, in, so. in, in a way, in a way, it's good because once you fig figure it out there, you'll be able to use it anywhere. You'll feel very confident about setting up growing plants in any, in any environment. Yeah, and we had like Jeff Lawton, one of our permaculture friends. You know, he's gone into Jordan 
and he's greening the desert, you know. Oh, wonderful. Techniques like this too and, and really helping um, those kind of environments, it's, you know, where they probably need the help. It's a bit like most of our customers are people who've never gardened before. So, you know, we're helping them to, to do something that they would have never have done if they hadn't have started thinking about their food waste. And, and I mean, the gardeners, they all know about it. Those well, people... like Sally, you do some gardening too. So it's nice to have everyone's shared experience of stuff that's worked for them we have a community resource for everyone to say hey try this out this has worked for me and you might want to consider that so one of the things for us is that we are in a subtropical environment so it's always nice in the wider community to have people that have the tough winters so that we can see what works well and share that and make sure everyone knows how to keep their system going for four seasons of the year absolutely so you can yeah. you can get the soil better in Texas because I was in Missouri and we were in the middle of clay and yeah. I okay. lived at the top of a ridge and had limestone down about 18 inches down. So, you know, you just keep adding stuff and adding mm -hmm. stuff and adding stuff and, you know, you'll get there. I had a big compost pile there and now we've retired. So we're smaller. So I don't, you know, I don't have access to the big yard. So I've had to do raised beds and that's, mm. that's a whole other story, but it's been working. One good. question That's I good. had was, um, what do you know about, um, or what can you tell me about textiles? Is that considered like 100%? I sew, I'm a quilter. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of quilting scraps and I have, um, you know, thread that's 100% cotton too. And I wondered mm -hmm. about putting that in the system or if that's a no-no. No, the thread is fine, although you might want to chop it up so it doesn't wind itself around the aerator when you're, when you're mm -hmm. mixing the food waste. And then the cotton you can actually use as worm blankets on top. So the thing to keep in mind in fabrics is, do they breathe well and are they natural materials? And I prefer cotton over wool because the wool tends to repel water and the cotton will tend to absorb it. So uh -huh. it, I think it's a better choice that way. The worms actually, will end up eating it. <laughs> yeah, I actually repurpose denim and make quilts for foster children. So oh, we take old oh, blue, okay. blue jeans oh, and cut good. them apart. And then oh. um, we custom make them for the child so that we know oh. we, from the agency what they like. And oh. so it'll have a baseball theme. And then we take the pockets and we embroider their name on the pockets. And they, oh, that's cool. Done that's like 3,000 quilts for foster children in, in about wow. 10 and a half years, 12, 12 wow. years now, I think. Wow. So. And they, they would last being made of denim too. So yeah. And they're that's like great. weighted blankets. So trauma affected kids have, mm. have the advantage of the weight too. Mm. So of I course. do have a denim lot of denim. Denim never goes out of style. <laughs> exactly. I saw your vest there. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, I have in the, in, in the past, I have thrown it out on the compost pile in my, when I had a big pile, but I wasn't sure on something as specific as this system, if that was a good idea or not. So what, what you'll, what you'll find is if it's in bigger pieces, it'll take longer to break down. It'll just get annoying sure. and you'll, you'll want to fish it out. But if it's in small pieces, um, you can experiment a little bit and see how fast, I think something as robust as denim might take longer to break down unless you snipped it up. So I mm -hmm. would see its role as more of a worm blanket rather than mm -hmm. as input for the composting so yeah. but the thread well, that's a good idea for winter well. I'll, I'll use that for mm. yeah. winter insulation so you uh, can make I think quilts for your worms you you <laughs> there you we can, go yeah. that's it there you go you you can shred <laughs> up some great. denim and then make a quilt where it's uh this this sides are yeah it well in another lifetime i would like to um find somebody that has invented a machine that shreds textiles there mm. is a company in st louis that does it but they're pretty they're they're hard to get into and mm -hmm. um, and I just there's got to be somebody to develop that technology because of the amount of waste that's out there. Mm -hmm. And I it's repurpose true. stuff all the time for I go and buy my fabric from reta retail shop or um, resale shops. Okay. You know curtains and stuff like that, and we make quilts for Lutheran World Relief that go all over the world. And if if I can buy a piece of fabric for five dollars, I'll do it instead of yeah twenty five. Okay. Yeah, thrift stores and options. I'm one of my favorite. Plus, you get you get you get colorful and and variety in your patterns that yeah. way too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Oh, it's an nice. addiction. <laughs> A good addiction. But right now, I want to be in the garden, so it's hard to sew. Right. Okay. Okay. Brandon. Question of using cotton t-shirt as blanket. Colored t-shirt is okay. Yeah. No, colored is fine. Um, I think the dyes. 
in the cotton are such that the nice thing about the environment for the subpod is um, it, it tends to break things down really well. So the colors that I tend to avoid in um, waste materials are, for example, glossy printed fabric because they use a lot of plastic components in those inks. And um, my general rule of thumb is to get people to not um, put put plastic into the subpod because the whole the whole understanding about microplastics is still being worked out. And if we can avoid it, then it's better. So that's why I was talking about natural fabrics. I would avoid the polyesters and those mm -hmm. sorts of things going in for the same reason. Right. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be concerned about the the, the tinting in, in fabrics for um for for putting in as a worm blanket. All right. Well, I think we're coming up on 1130 if there's no more questions, but happy to um, any last minute things that have occurred to you guys or anything that occurs to you after our chat, go ahead and post them up on Ask Dr. Compost and we'll get back to you with them in the future. So good, good meeting up in person. That's why I like the Zooms. We like the Zooms because yeah. we could actually connect to the community a bit. Yeah, really nice. And thanks for joining us, Austin and Ali. It was so great to see you there and to the fabulous cuddly toy. And, and, Don't know if that one's and, got a name. And Sally, thanks for sharing your garden experiences. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Keep sharing all that fabulous expert and ideas with our community as and well. And good luck, Brandon, on harvesting your compost. Let us know how you go with foliar feeding. All right, everyone. See you next time. See you. Bye.